Amen. On the 10th day of the month of Nisan, we know that day is Palm Sunday, Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and on the colt, a foal of a donkey. And when he rode in, it was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9 that says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on the colt, of the foal of a donkey. In Daniel chapter 9, there's a prophecy that states that from the issuing of the decree and to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, it will be seven and 62 weeks. And that works out as actually 483 years. The weeks means seven. So seven sevens, uh, 40, uh, 42 sevens, seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now, what's that all mean? Dr. Harold Honer from da Dallas Theological Seminary calculated the time of when the decree went forth to restore the temple in Jerusalem, and it works out to end somewhere around the 10th of Nisan, A.D. 32 or 33, depending on who did the interpretation of what he wrote. But what I'm trying to say here is this. Yeshua entered Jerusalem on the exact date that Daniel prophesied that the people would recognize him as Messiah. And also, he came in on the exact date when on the 10th of Nisan in Exodus 12, the Jewish people were supposed, were supposed to choose their lamb for Passover. Yeshua walks in, and they're shouting proclamations of praises to him, choosing him as Messiah at the same time the heads of every house were choosing the lamb that was to be slain four days later. That was mentioned in Exodus chapter 12. Before they left Egypt, they had to slay their lamb and put the blood on the doorposts of their house. Why? Because that night, the final plague was coming, the destruction, of the, the, the death of the firstborn child in, in, throughout all of Egypt. But if you were in a house that had the blood upon the doorposts and lintel of the house, you were spared that death. So the firstborn would not die, no matter what they were. If they were Jewish, if they were Egyptian, it didn't matter. If they were in the house, they were covered. So on the 10th of Nisan, Israel chose Yeshua to be their savior. And yet four days later, they shouted, crucify him. Why? Because they thought he was going to come in as a king, get rid of the Romans, establish himself as king of the earth, and they were going to live in peace and prosperity forever. They didn't realize he first had to come and die for us. See, when a king rides in on a donkey, it's a lot different than a king riding a horse. When a king comes in riding on a horse, he's coming in victory. He's telling everybody, I'm here, and I'm in charge. But when a king would enter a kingdom or a city riding a donkey, he was coming to bring peace. And that's what Yeshua did when he came in that day. He brought peace. Now, how do we have that peace? When we have Yeshua in our hearts. So although this past weekend we celebrated Passover on Friday night, we celebrated Passover and remembered how God freed the, the Jewish people from slavery, from the sin of slavery, we as believers can rejoice that if you have Jesus in your heart, you have Yeshua's blood upon the doorposts of your heart, your sins are washed away, they are forgiven. The blood of the lamb would only cover the sins of the people, but the blood of the lamb of God washes away all sins. So this, this Resurrection Sunday morning, we could rejoice because the stone was rolled away, right? The stone was rolled away. He is risen, and we could rejoice in God knowing that we are saved. Amen. That's okay. I could keep on talking. Well, listen, I'm going to talk about finding Messiah in the Passover. And the whole goal behind this is to show Yeshua, that's how we say Jesus in Hebrew, to show Yeshua throughout the whole Passover presentation. He's there from the beginning to the very end of Passover. 
But the beauty behind this is that we see Yeshua in every aspect of the Passover, from the Seder to the whole holiday, and hopefully this will show us, this will get us excited about sharing our faith with others and help us better understand what it means to follow Messiah. I'll work without it. I want you to close your eyes, since this is not working right now. <laughs> What is probably one of the most famous paintings of Leonardo da Vinci besides... Oh, there we are. Hallelujah. Besides the Mona Lisa, what is probably one of his most famous paintings? Anybody? The Last Supper. Here we see Jesus in the center and the 12 apostles on either side. And at this point, when da Vinci painted it, he painted it from the interpretation that is at this point that Jesus said, one of you will betray me. Uh, someone did some historical research and found out that this was, this was the first selfie ever taken. And because you know them all on one side of the table. But the, but the, the whole scene is wrong because the Passover was not celebrated at a big table like that. And what they're serving is definitely not something you're going to see at the Passover. You'll see the type of bread that's on that table. You'll see that they have nice, thick loaves of Italian bread. <laughs> Passover is supposed to be a time where for, eight, for seven days, you don't eat leaven. So it's going to be unleavened matzah. But Da Vinci, he's Italian. He puts Italian bread up there. <laughs> they're all sitting at this big table where actually they, were, they sat at a table that was only about a foot or a foot and a half off the ground called a triclinium. And I'll show you that picture in a second. And I'll talk about why that's important. But here we see them also, what it was served over there. If you look closely, they served fish. Now, why do you think da Vinci painted it with fish on the plates? Because no good Catholic eats meat on Holy Thursday. Simple as that. That literally is the reason why there's fish there. So Da Vinci's picture, although it's beautiful, sorry, sorry, Leo, it's wrong. The triclinium is the type of table they sat at. It was a low table, sort of U-shaped, and the apostles sat around it. If you go to the top part portion, the fellow balding head with the black hair, that would be John the Beloved. John Beloved sat there because he was the closest friend to Messiah. Out of all the apostles, he was the closest to John. And when you have a Seder, you have to lie down. You'll see them all like sort of lying down, and they're supposed to be reclining on their left side because you only eat with your right hand. And when you pass food around, you only pass to the person next to you to your left. So food is always passed this way. And if I'm the host, I want my best friend next to me. I know he's going to look out for me. I know he's going to take care of me. And I know he's not going to try to play any tricks on me. So the second person, and they made him a redhead, is Yeshua. I don't know if he was Scottish Irish, but I don't think so. But that's OK. That's the artist's interpretation. But that second person would be Yeshua. That's where the host sat. The host sat at the second seat at the table. And everybody after him went from greatest of importance to the least importance. Remember, after, while during the meal, they were arguing who's going to be the greatest of them all? They were arguing over the table. Where, who's supposed to be sitting where? But Yeshua sat them in a specific order, and the last fellow closest to us on that side is Peter. Peter sat in the servant's seat. Now, how do we know this? Because when Yeshua said, one of you will betray me, they all started questioning to themselves, who's, who's going to betray him? Who's going to betray him? Peter, actually being closest to John, signaled to John, find out who he's talking about. And so John was able to lean to his left into Yeshua's bosom, because they were that close, and said, Lord, who are you talking to? And he said, the one with whom I dip with. And then Yeshua dipped it and gave it to the man sitting in the guest of honor's seat, Judas. And then Yeshua told them, go do what you have to do quickly. It's powerful when you look at this that the guest of honor, the person of highest importance at the Last Supper, will betray him, literally a few hours later. So that's powerful when you think of this. 
Now, what is Passover? Exodus chapter 12 teaches us this. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, they must each, each select an animal of the flock according to their father's households. Now, when you select that animal, you must have an unblemished animal, a year old male, and you may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight, which is around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat them. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. I am Yahweh. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark to you, for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So that's the whole aspect behind Passover. Now, before you have to have Passover, the house has to be cleaned. Remove all leaven from the house. Why is that important? Leaven represents sin. You put a little leaven in a bunch of flour, and that bread will rise. They didn't use leaven, though, for Passover because they had to leave in haste. If anybody has ever made bread, it takes about an hour or two for the leaven to rise, depending on the type of bread you're making. They didn't have that time. So God had to make matzah bread. Matzah is also known as the bread of affliction and also the poor man's bread. Because if you have nothing else, if you have a little flour and a little water, you can make something for your family to eat. So they had to make the matzah, and they had to make, make sure the house was clear of all leaven. And the way they did it is with a spoon and a feather. I don't know why. I don't think there's any spiritual aspect behind it, but... They used a spoon and a feather. It's used to clean the house of leaven. Now, of course, you know, they're going to sweep the whole house and vacuum it, make sure there's nothing there. But the papa was responsible for the leaven to be cleaned. So usually in every Jewish household, if the mother's responsible for cleaning, she'll leave a little crumb on the floor for papa to clean up. This way he could declare the house clean. And he'll use a spoon and a feather to clear the house clean. Sort of like something we do when we receive communion. Before we receive communion, we're always, it's always recommended. Stop, pause, and do some reflection to see, did I do anything wrong this week, Lord, that really was displeasing to you? We could all raise our hands and say yes. And we could ask God to cleanse our hearts of that leaven of sin that's there. And that's the beauty of the Lord, because he does cleanse our hearts. So after the house is cleaned, we then would have what's called... The Seder plate. We would have a Seder. Now, the Seder plate, on there are a few different things. Starting at the top, there's a shank bone, a lamb's shank bone. There's also bitter herbs. The, the shank bone's known as zeroa. The bitter herbs in Hebrew are called maror. Apples, nuts, spices, and wine. It's a mixture, a nice, tasty mixture. Of, uh, it's called charoset. That's part of the Seder plate. You'll also see lettuce, which is also called uh, chadaset, and that's looked at as also being a bitter herb. Finally, you'll see parsley, which is also called carpus. And the last thing you see there is a roasted egg, beitza. And they're all on the Seder plate, and they all have a certain meaning, and I'll get into those in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. We also have our matzah bread, very flat, known as the bread of affliction. And if you eat it without anything on it, you'll understand why. It's dry. It hurts if you bite it the wrong way. It's, it's crunchy. But that's matzah bread. That was the bread that was made, wasn't square back then, but you know, machines make it today, but it still has the same process. Matzah bread actually has to be made within 18 minutes from start to finish. If it's not finished within 18 minutes, they throw the whole batch out because flour naturally starts to ferment a little bit after 18 minutes. So they have to make sure no leaven even appears in there. So matzah is made, and after the matzah, we also have four cups for the Passover Seder, four cups of wine. We celebrate with four cups of wine during the Seder. The first cup is known as the cup of sanctification. 
The second cup, the cup of plagues or cup of deliverance. The third cup, the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup, the cup of praise. I'll discuss each one of those cups. Uh, talk about sanctification now, the first one. Looking at sanctification, sanctification means to be set apart, to be holy, separate from what the world does. John 17, the Lord prayed to the Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, which means set apart for God's holy service. In the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. As believers, Yeshua, he, he, he's set us apart, and he asks us also to set ourselves apart from the ways of the world. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Messiah, correct? So we just want to be separate from the world. Not taken out, not staying away, and not associating. We should be in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. And that's the whole purpose behind that. And with the matzah, like I mentioned before, matzah, it's a different type of bread. It's not something that you would normally eat every day. Again, it allows us to sort of reflect, okay, why are we doing this? It's because the Lord has a message for us he, uh, over here. Now... We have also a lamb shank bone. There you go. Come on, shank bone. Signal's not working. There's a lamb shank bone on the, uh, on the Seder plate. Oh, went too far. Back. The lamb shank bone, it represents the lamb that was the slain, and they would eat that the night of Passover. Most Jewish people don't have lamb for their Seder anymore because there's no temple. Lambs were sacrificed. You only do sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. And since there's no temple, they can't sacrifice any lambs, so they don't want to have a, a, a lamb for Passover. But they will have the shank bone there to represent the lamb that was slain so they could put the blood on the doorposts of their house. The shank bone, in a sense, represents our Messiah, who was slain, and when we receive him as our Savior, his blood is applied to the doorposts of our house. Amen? Amen. Now, the carpus. It's parsley. I'm partial. I have Italian parsley up there. I'm Italian, so I put Italian parsley. You could use curly parsley. You could have Italian. I don't recommend cilantro. I like it, but it's not for this purpose. Because what you do with this, if you look at the carpus, it's green. Green represents life. It's springtime, you see the flowers are starting to bloom, and you see the grass is getting a little greener, and we start getting our April showers to bring us the May flowers. Remember that song? Anyhow, green represents life. And what you're supposed to do with the carpus, you're supposed to take it and dip it in salted water, say a prayer over it, and eat it. The salted water represents the tears that were shed while they were slaves in Egypt. And the green represents the life that we all have. In other words, try and say, in life, we're always going to have tears. There's always going to be pain and sorrow in life. It's unavoidable. We as believers realize that as well. But our tears one day will be wiped away when we enter into that glorious kingdom with the Lord. And could I get an amen on that? All righty. So you eat that corpus, and it reminds us of the tears that were shed, but it's beautiful how our Messiah wipes away all tears from their eyes. Hey, Micah, stay in the room for five minutes, okay? And then you can go in the back. Have a seat. I'm going to need him. We also have the lettuce. They also sometimes consume that as a bitter herb. But here's the real bit of stuff. That's horseradish, maror. Raw horseradish, it's tough. It represents the bitterness of life as well. There's a lot of bitterness in this holiday. But it's also a celebratory holiday because it reminds us of what we went through and what we have now. They recline because they're sitting in leisure. They're not running anymore. Back then they had to run. They had to work hard. But now we could sit and recline 
in peace. But the maror is very bitter, and it's used to remind us of the bitterness of things that happen, the bitterness of slavery, and for us, the bitterness of, the bitterness of slavery to sin. Now, I'm just waiting for my thing to load. You're supposed to eat this, and when they eat the maror, it burns. You're supposed to eat it with the bread of affliction, with the matzah. It is really tough, and I'm going to go ahead just a bit. Let me go back. Okay. Before we get to that, I forgot to mention the roasted egg. The roasted egg and the hurlset. Roasted egg is used because it represents the burned, the, the destroyed temple in Jerusalem. When Titus in 70 AD destroyed the temple, he literally tore it down to the point that no one knows exactly where the original temple was on the Temple Mount. There's no evidence there. The Temple Mount itself, the western wall that we have, that wasn't part of the temple. That's the retaining wall to keep the whole Temple Mount set in order. And the temple up on the Temple Mount area, it's gone. And the reason why the Romans destroyed it so much and took away all the stones is because they believed that gold was interwoven into the stones. So they brought it back to Rome to see if they could melt the stuff down. It was for money. And they took everything out of there. They took all the utensils in the, in the temple. Everything that was in the temple is gone. The roasted hard-boiled egg represents the destruction of that temple. Now, I mentioned before the cup of sanctification, and we talked about that. After the cup of sanctification, here's one of my favorite parts. We would drink the cup of sanctification to start the Seder. And after that, we have what's called the matzah tash and the afi komen. Matzah, like I said, the bread of affliction, is kept in a little bag. And the matzah tash is a three-panel uh, three bag. There's three separate sections in the matzah tash. This matzah tash, you can't see it, but I'll have it on our table outside. This was designed by my daughter when she was about six years old. This is uh, Elsa and Anna from Frozen. And uh, I found that their names are not Elsa and Anna, it's uh, Elsie and Hannah. Uh, they're, they're Jewish, and Bella designed that for us, and uh, it is my favorite matzatash. I, I love this, and I did this to embarrass her. And in the, in the, in the matzatash, there were three compartments, and only one of them is ever used. Uh, I'm sorry. The three compartments hold three different pieces of matzah but you're only supposed to take out the middle matzah. Now, Jewish historians believe it represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Others believe it represents God, the high priest, and man. God being the first one, the high priest being the one you see, and man. And the reason why for that is that they, the high priest, when on Yom Kippur, when the high priest had to make a sacrifice, he had to intercede for man before God. So they would walk into the Holy of Holies and they would have two lambs with them. One they would slay for themselves for forgiveness of their sins. And then the high priest would slay the lamb on Yom Kippur for the sins of all of the people. I like to look at it this way. I look at the matzah as housing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't see the Father. We don't really see the Holy Spirit. But we saw Yeshua. And we're going to see him again. And the only matzah that you see is that middle matzah. And what happens is they're supposed to take out the middle matzah, break it in two, take the bigger piece, put it back on the side, and, and take the smaller piece and hand it out to everybody. And the blessing said over the bread. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam hamosi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And the people would partake in that. And, yeah, and that's, that's it for the matzah. Now, the next one, this is a, the cup of plagues. That's kind of gross looking, a cup covered with fleas and flies and stuff like that. Remember, the ten plagues of, in, in, in Egypt were horrible. And... 
each one of those plagues, and this is too long to describe now, but each one of those plagues attacked a different god of Egypt. That's why God said in Exodus 12, I will attack all of those gods of Egypt. They had many gods. And each plague attacked like the ten most, the ten most popular, I guess. The cup of plagues is not really drunk. The cup of sanctification we drink, but the cup of plagues we don't drink. Instead, what people do is you dip your pinky in it, and as the plagues are red, you sprinkle a, bit, a drop of the, of the wine on your plate. It's to commemorate those plagues, and the reason you don't drink it is really simple. We never want to rejoice in anybody's death or suffering, even if it's an enemy. That's not something God would be pleased in seeing us do. Yay, he's dead. No, that's not something you're going to hear coming out of the mouth of Yeshua or, or of God. It's, we would mourn for people who die, especially people who die without knowing Messiah, because they're facing an eternity without him. And that's a scary thought when you think of it. So instead of drinking to the cup of plates, we just commemorate them by placing a drop on, on the plate of, of the wine. After you have the cup of plagues, you would have maror, the bitter herbs, with matzah. This maror is red because sometimes they dip it in, put beet juice in there to sort of cut down the sharpness of it. It's still bitter, but the reason why they would eat the, the bitter herbs with the matzah, again, the bitterness of life with the bread of affliction. And it, and it tastes hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard to enjoy because it's really sharp. It'll bring tears to your eyes. Guarantee. We did it Friday night, and I thought Micah was going to lose it. But it was hilarious, and this is what we do. So we tried to torture our children with matzah. But to make it easier on us, we take the plagues, and we mix, mix the bitter herbs with the matzah and the charoset, that sweet apple mixture. And the funny thing is, when you put the apple mixture with the charoset, it's not that bitter anymore. Life can be tough, and it could be really bitter, but when we have the sweetness of Messiah in our lives, it makes it bearable. It actually could make it even enjoyable because we know that God will carry us through. Now, there's one thing that's done during the Passover Seder. You might have heard the four questions. Everybody knows those four questions, and the kid usually have the youngest child sing the four questions. So I'm going to ask Micah, if he would come up, and he's just going to sing the four questions. No, Micah, come on. Be serious. Just do it in Hebrew. Manishtana halayla haze mikol halaylot shebekol halaylot anu echlin chametu matzah Halayla haze, halayla haze, kulo matza. Halayla haze, halayla haze, kulo matza. Sheve kol halelot, anu echlin, shear yerakot, shear yerakot. Halayla haze, halayla haze. Wait. Can I re can I restart? Oh yeah. A filu pamechat, a filu pamechat, halayla haze, halayla haze, shetefe amin, halayla haze, halayla haze, shetefe amin. Shebekol halalot en anu matpelin, ben yoshvinu ben subin. Ben Yoshvinu ben Subin Halayla haze, halayla haze Kulan me Subin Halayla haze, 
Halai lahaze kulan mesubin. <laughs> He's so shy. Pray for him. That kid is so shy. The four questions in English. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leaven products and matzah, and on this night, only matzah. On all other nights, we eat all vegetables, but on this night, only bitter herbs. On all other nights, we don't dip our food even once, and on this night, we dip twice. On all other nights, we, we, are eat, we eat sitting or reclining, and on this night, we only recline. And at this point, you would then go into the longest portion of the Seder where they would read from the scriptures, and they would read from the rabbi's commentary and rabbi's commentary on the rabbi's commentary. And a Seder could go for two and a half to four and a half hours, depending on how fast people read and how serious they really take doing all that. Um, in my wife's family, the Seder used to take 10 minutes. So we knew it was important to Ruth and High Gold. Food. But, uh, but that's okay. Because the beautiful thing is this. It doesn't really matter because in Messiah, we have freedom. Amen? So that's why Micah sang those four questions. And it's all designed to educate the children. That's one of the big purposes behind this as well, to teach the children the history behind the Passover and why we do this. And we, as, as believers, we should do this as well with our children. Teach them the word of God. Teach them about Messiah. Live, the, live that life with Messiah. So, praise God. Remember I said before we had the Afi Komen? Well, I left out one important part of the Afi Komen. We would break it in two and hide one of the pieces. Why did it switch? Having technical difficulties, Pastor. Well, that's not what I want. No. You're there. No. Okay, here we go. We take the matzah, the smaller one, we wrap it up, and we hide it somewhere in the house when the kids aren't looking. And the purpose of that is that it's going to be found after dinner. After they had the matzah, and after they had the matzah with the charoset and with the moror, we have a big meal. And the meal is wonderful. It's really enjoyable. Uh, your meal usually serves chicken. You could serve meat. Uh, most people don't do lamb, like I said before. Uh, maybe brisket. You'll have matzah ball soup. Who loves matzah ball soup? It's good stuff. That's good stuff. So the food is really good, and that's the biggest celebration of the, of, the, of the holiday, to enjoy fellowship with the family and friends and enjoy a wonderful meal together. And then after the meal comes the dessert. Find the afikomen. Remember I said the father hides the afikomen somewhere in the house and then says, okay, kids, go find the afikomen. And they'll start clamoring around the house. And you'll go, okay, get cold. You're getting warmer. Oh, you're ice cold. Oh, now you're hot. You're really hot. And the kid who finds the afikomen, they get a prize. They actually, Papa of the house buys it back from them. The going price this year is $5. So I have to zell $5 to Micah's account when, I, when we're done. I forgot to do that Friday night. But we give $5. And it's important that the Papa buys the afikomen, just doesn't take it from the child. You have to buy it from the child. And then we would take the afikomen, break it, and share it with everybody at the table. It was at this point during the Lord's Supper, which was actually the Lord's last Seder, that he took the afikomen. I don't know who was the youngest of the apostles. It might have been John. But whoever found that afikomen, the Lord took that afikomen. And he just didn't break it and hand it to them. But he said, this is my body, which will be given up for you. Now, I was raised in the faith where I was taught that that was the literal body of Jesus. And when I got saved, I still struggled with that. Like, did this really happen? But then when I studied, I understood what he meant by this. Matzah is known as what? The bread of affliction. 
matzah represents why they had to flee Egypt. And as the bread of affliction or the poor man's bread, the matzah is broken for the people. Yeshua is saying that he is going to be broken so that we don't have to be broken. He will be the one broken so that our sins will be forgiven. He'll be the one broken so that God's wrath will come upon him rather than on the rest of us. So when he broke that, he said, take, the, take eat, this is my body. They knew he meant his body was going to become that bread of affliction for him. After that came the cup of redemption. He took the cup, the third cup of the Seder, drunk after dinner, and he lifted up and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, and it'll be shed for all sin. He wasn't saying that the cup, the, the wine was turning into his blood. What he was saying is this, my shed blood will redeem you from the punishment of sin. Redemption, part of redemption involves the paying of a price. That's why I got to pay Micah $5 because he found the Afikomen. There's a price involved in paying for redemption. God paid the ultimate price by sending his only begotten son to die for us. No greater price than that than sacrificing your own child for somebody else. And that's what God did for us. He redeemed us through the blood of his son. So Yeshua said, I am that cup of redemption. My blood, through my blood, your sins will be washed away. I mentioned earlier that today that the blood of the lamb that was slain both on, on Passover and even on Yom Kippur only covered people's sins. It wasn't a means of salvation. It covered your sins. But the blood of Messiah, it washes away our sins as if they never existed. So if you have a past that, oh, Brother Joe, you don't want to hear about my past, I don't need to. It's gone. In God's eyes, it's forgotten. It's cast into a sea of forgetfulness, and it's not there anymore. It's gone. So no matter what you might have done in life in the past, before you gave your heart to Messiah, it's forgotten. And we could sit comfortably at our own table and realize, I've been redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. Can I get an amen? amen. I just got a couple of more slides. Elijah's cup. Every Seder table has a very important place setting. It's a full place setting with a full course, full, all the courses of meal in front of it, and a full cup of wine. That's Elijah's cup, because the Jewish people believe that Elijah's going to come before the coming of the Messiah. Now, we all know that John the Baptist fulfilled that, because John basically was like Elijah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And, and Yeshua even said that Elijah has come, that John basically took Elijah's spot. But our Jewish friends don't know that. So every Passover, they have this Elijah's cup and the Elijah's plate, and they tell the youngest child, go to the door, see if Elijah's here. And I've heard a lot of funny stories that the kid opened the door and there's an uncle and aunt just showing up. And it's kind of funny, Grant. <laughs> uncle Louise, Elijah, come on in. My funniest story is that I was doing a presentation like this at the church. And I said, Micah, go to the store and see if Elijah's there. Micah opened the door. Eli Micah, is anybody, is Elijah there? He said, I don't know, Dad, what's he look like? <laughs> it was the funniest thing. Couldn't make it up. So that's Elijah. After Elijah's cup is the fourth cup, the cup of praise. Number one, you're praising the Lord because the four-and-a-half-hour meal is now over. But more importantly, we can praise God because we drank that cup of redemption. Our Messiah has died for us, and we've been set free so we could do nothing but praise the Lord. Amen? We could rejoice in knowing that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We could rejoice that our sins have been washed away, they have been forgiven, and that we have eternity set for us already, starting now, set forth for us to spend an eternity rejoicing in God's presence. So the cup of praise is there, that we praise God, that we survived another year, and the next phrase that comes along at the end of the Seder is always, Next year in Jerusalem. They don't say that just because I want a vacation in Jerusalem, but there's a very important reason behind next year in Jerusalem. You see, when Messiah comes, I mean, 
the scriptures say in both the, the Old Testament and the New, when he comes, he's going to be coming back to Jerusalem. And he's going to be setting himself up as the king in Jerusalem. And every year in Judaism, Jewish people had to go to Israel, had to go to Jerusalem three times a year. They had to go at Passover. They had to go at Shavuot. We know it as, as Pentecost. And they had to go at Sukkot, which was the Feast of Tabernacles. Those are three holidays that they must go to Jerusalem to do worship and sacrifices at the temple. But there's no temple. So they don't do that now. Next year in Jerusalem means Messiah is back, his temple is established, and we can praise the Lord together with him. So next year in Jerusalem, that'd be a really nice prayer. With everything going on in this crazy world, it would be nice if all of that, if all of this ends, no more war, no more hunger, we could just live with Messiah. To close, so what? What is the purpose of all this? Why is it important to understand everything about the Passover? Well, number one, it helps us understand the Jewish roots of our faith. It helps us identify that, okay, now I can understand why the Jewish people believe certain things and how it ties into Jesus. It so also allows us to share some common values that we have literally with our Jewish neighbors right behind me. We have the common value of freedom, of faith, and of family. There's a commonality there. And finally, it shows us that Passover is a feast of redemption and that our ultimate redemption comes from the shed blood of Messiah. So my question for all of you is this. Has the blood of Messiah washed away your sins? Have you asked him? There go my notes. I don't need them anymore. Has the blood of Messiah washed away our sins? Has it redeemed us? Has it set us free from the law of sin and death. Thank you, brother. Has the blood of Messiah cleansed your heart? Or are you still wondering? I don't know if he's really my savior. I was once asked a question by somebody, can God make a stone big enough that he can't move? Now, we know the answer to that question is God will not do something that's against his character. He can't reject somebody who's asked Jesus into their heart. He can't. He can't turn his back on his children. He just can't. But this fellow is asking to try to trick me. Like, well, if God can't move a stone, then maybe he's not God. And I said, you know, I'm going to think about this question. See that stone up there that was rolled away? I called him up. And I said, God cannot remove the stone that's blocking your heart from accepting his son as Messiah. Only you could allow him to roll away the stone. And that's my suggestion to you. This is all wonderful, all well and good, and today's a beautiful Resurrection Sunday, and you all look lovely, and you're all going to go out and have a wonderful dinner. But if he's not your Messiah, it's meaningless. It has no purpose. I want to challenge you. Michelle's going to come and sing, and our lovely friend, friend Hannah is going to dance. And I want to challenge you contemplate receiving Jesus into your heart as your Savior, that you too could have your heart. Remove that stone from your heart, and you too could have him living right here. And that when he comes back on that white horse, you're going to be with him in Israel, and you're going to be with him in heaven forever. Hallelujah. Father, we just give you praise. Lord, we thank you for your love, your sacrifice. Lord, that you sent your son so many years ago because of your great and profound love for us. Father, I pray as we close out this service that, Lord, your anointing would be sensed here in this place. In Jesus' name. You know, as we were talking about how we would end this service, we just felt like it would be appropriate to end with communion. And I'm going to invite our ushers to begin to make themselves ready as they are doing. Uh, but I want to say something to you. We, first of all, at Frontline Christian Center, we observe open communion. What does that mean? That means you don't have to be a member of this church to partake. You just have to be a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And you're welcome to join us in communion.
And I, I thought Joe did a tremendous job in outlining what the Passover was all about. It has so much significance uh, about the Messiah, the coming Messiah, and what he would do. And I'm going to invite you, go ahead and begin to pass out the elements. Thank you. <clears throat> and so this morning, we have brought good news. We've got great news this morning. You are the one that God loves. Right now, it, it, his eye is upon you. Right now, he, he sees you this morning. He sees us as we're about to partake of communion, which God has instructed us to do. God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, say whosoever, whosoever in the Greek that means whosoever <laughs> doesn't mean there's some special group out there that will receive eternal life and there's some that are going to experience damnation that God has previously ordained that's not scriptural well my my aunt says or my uncle says well your aunt or uncle is wrong because that does not reflect the entirety of scripture the Bible says, whosoever. For God commendeth his love toward us. That's inclusive. Us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and for me. And so Jesus came so many years ago, sent of God our Father, to declare his love for you and for me. I'm so grateful for that. God loves us. We have a, a God who cares and loves us. I was reminded not too long ago, my, my mom, who's recently gone to be with the Lord, she, she used to have dreams. And in her dreams, uh, they would, uh, it was a gifting. The dreams that she would have would come to pass. I, I can't tell you how many dreams that she would have. They were prophetic, but they would come to pass. And she had a dream that she was with a friend, and they were, and she was eating a hot fudge sundae with a fudge cake on the bottom. I mean, mmm. <laughs> and she woke up. What in the world does that mean? What would you think? And she, it puzzled her, and she shared with us. She, I, I have no idea what this means. And she began to pray about it, and the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, D, I care about even the small things in your life. And that came to pass. She was with a girlfriend of hers. And they said, hey, let's, aren't you hungry for ice cream, Dee? Let's go get some ice cream. And she went and got ice cream. She had forgotten the dream until she had that first bite of that hot fudge sundae with the brownie. And the Holy Spirit reminded her, listen to me, church. I want everyone listening to me. This is so important. God cares about even the smallest things in your life. Sometimes we think we can only bring God the big things. I want you to know he cares for the smallest details of your life. He's crazy in love with you. And just like you want to bestow wonderful gifts on your children, he does for you too. Hallelujah. Has everyone been served? Except for me, Pastor. Thank you, Morley. A different one. I can't get them out of the tray. Something we do at Frontline Christian Center, I want you to repeat these scriptures after me, and we're going to look at the first scripture. And I want you to repeat this after me. I think we'll have it up on the screen. Would you just recite this with me as you take that wafer that you have in your hand? It says this. 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the wafer. Father, we thank you for what this represents. Lord, it represents your suffering that you endured on the cross as you gave your life for us. Your body was torn and ripped because of your love for us. And Lord, as you have instructed, we partake together in Jesus' name. Shall we partake together? And then he took the cup. And he held it up. And would you repeat this? It's important that every one of us say this passage of Scripture. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Just in this one verse, we, we could do an entire series just on this one verse. It's so powerfully packed. But let me just make this short. His blood represents our redemption. It was shed for us. Once again, God just didn't say he loved us. He showed us in his actions that he loved us. Amen. Father, we thank you for what this cup represents. It represents your blood. It represents a new covenant. And Father, we do this as you have instructed in remembrance of you. Hallelujah. Shall we partake of the cup together? Hallelujah. We have a, a song as the trio makes themselves ready. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you for this service that we've had today. Lord, it reminds us of so much. So much to just take in, Father, what you've done for us. And Lord, the things that are represented, and Father, in your word, in the Passover, and all the way up to the cross. But Father, we celebrate that, Lord, you not only died on a cross, but more importantly, you rose again. We celebrate a resurrection, resurrected Lord. Father, we give you praise for it in your precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.